Hello and welcome to the first session at TESS this year. I get the pleasure of kicking off this event with a panel of learners whom you might recognize if you attended TESS last year. We have invited our panelists back from last year so we can reflect on their journey and join me in welcoming four talented individuals. I'll start with Malik, Malik Abu Rabia. You're a current student at Brock University pursuing a dual degree in business administration and management at the Goodman School of Business. And you're also a policy writer for the Brock University Students Union. That's fantastic. Up next, we have Ali Kazmi, who is a recent graduate at the University of Toronto. And you're currently a researcher at OCAD's Inclusive Design Research Center, where you're building micro-credentials for a project called We Count. Also very, very cool. Also with us is Shamal Gormesh, an international learner who is a recent graduate of hospitality and tourism at Centennial College. And you're currently a training and e-learning coordinator at the Ontario Tourism Education Corporation. Very cool. Lastly, we have Sydney Cooling Sturgis, who is a recent graduate of OCAD's Industrial Product Design Program. And Sydney is also an award-winning designer based in Toronto, who is currently a creative consultant at an organization called Habit Factory Space. Welcome as well. Welcome everyone. I guess since TESS 2020, most of you have graduated or are pursuing additional studies. I mean, congratulations. I mean, we felt it would be very interesting to continue the conversation about your experiences with post-secondary education. I mean, the focus so far has been on the impact of the pandemic and your life as a current student. But now that most of you have graduated, we want to hear about how you're managing upon graduation and what you're hearing from current students. I mean, each of you bring a unique perspective that I think is historically significant. You all have had an unexpected journey. I mean, you began your educational career before the pandemic. You got a taste for how your education was supposed to look like. And, and then you got a crash course to an emergency shift to remote teaching and learning. And now we are here two years later, still wrestling with this global pandemic. And what was considered the norm now feels like a distant memory, I think. And so we brought you all back to reflect on the evolution of your post-secondary learning journey to get a better sense of what the new normal looks like, if we can call it the new normal. And I think one thing is for sure, we can no longer say the sector is dealing with an emergency shift to remote teaching and learning because what was once a tiny fraction of course delivery is now perceivably the new normal, at least a combination of tech-enabled and in-person. So my first question for you all today is, what is the new normal and what does that look like? I'll start with Sydney, if that's all right. Thank you, Chris. I think the new normal, what does it look like? I think in some instances, it looks very similar to the old normal. I think of someone like my mom, she is a high school teacher in the city of Toronto, and they are back in the classroom now, and they're doing a kind of hybrid model. And that is really a huge part of what they were doing last year as well. So I think for a lot of those teachers and especially the students, a, a lot of grade nines and tens, this is all that they've known. So the new normal is very much a little bit in person, a little bit online, but it's not as if those students are really new to technology and technology enabled classrooms. You know, I remember when they introduced smart boards in my classrooms <laughs> when I was a kid. So I think you know, the new normal isn't necessarily as scary as it maybe sounds. Sometimes it sounds a bit intimidating when you when you say it new normal. I I think it's a little a little more familiar than we maybe thought, whereas in the post-secondary world, at least for OCAD, we've been fully virtual and this is an art and design university, right? Where you're sort of sold on all of the tools that you'll have access to in the studios and then it becomes entirely virtual. So that new normal, I think looks like, you know, evolving with your trade very rapidly, that everything has become online. What do studios look like online? You know, you're just trying your best, really, <laughs> sitting at home in your home office. 
Thank you for sharing, Sydney. No, you're absolutely right. The new normal is probably not so much of an innovation for many people. It's probably very commonplace for, for most students, especially ones in K-12 to that are just starting out. They don't even know what it's like to be in the old normal, so to speak. I'll pick on Malik next. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I think that's a great question. So my uh, journey within the post-secondary realm has been pretty interesting. So I'm in my third year of my undergrad, and ever since then, so my first year was sort of like three quarters in person. Uh, my second year was obviously adapting to the emergency response to the pandemic. And sort of my third year, I'm now like adapting, the dust is sort of settling. But I also transferred universities in the process, which has also been an interesting challenge amongst itself. Um, but sort of like, I, I think that this evolution has actually been really uh, beneficial to the sector of, as, a, as a whole, um, especially with um, like while addressing some some of the um, priorities that eCampus Ontario specifically has had, like high flex learning, for example, or uh, OER specifically. So I actually think it's a really exciting time for the sector. Um, I think personally, yeah, it has been pretty uh you know like a roller coaster <laughs> a lot of ups and downs and a lot of uh you know high speed chases and things like that um but i think overall um it's been it's given it's allowed the opportunity for a lot of students to have uh the accommodations and the tools that weren't available or even considered before um and i think that's really cool um i think this is also a really good time to like really take a look at the sector holistically and uh, and see like what the future holds. I think this is a really exciting time, both uh, as a student and someone working uh, in the sector as well. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm pretty optimistic about this kind of thing. Um, but overall, um, I think I I really like where things are heading right now. Anyway, thank you for sharing, Malik. So you're you're a transfer student, and that must have been an interesting experience to do that in a pandemic. Have you noticed sort of? I guess, a different type of setup or an approach from your previous institution to your current one? Yeah, so my old institution uses the G Suite um, sort of platform and, and this one sort of uses the, the Microsoft uh, platform. So it's been a really big uh, shift and it's been really interesting to see like the differences between the like the um, like the D2Ls and those sort of platforms as well as just not using like Google Docs now and now moving to Word and, and Excel and all that jazz. Um, but, you know, so it's pretty interesting to see like how different sectors utilize different tools. Um, but yeah, especially to go from a year fully virtual to now moving to a campus I ever I never even got the chance to physically see before. Um, so I think, you know, as a third year, it's fine because I'm sort of used to being in school, uh, but for those, um, those newer students that have have always been used to or have recently been used to um, doing secondary school online, I think this is a bigger shift to going from this very familiar secondary school environment, especially online, to this much harder content, as well as being in campus, living by yourself in this really crazy environment that some many students are not used to. So seeing this from uh, first year on this campus, but also a third year in general. It's been very interesting to see. Uh, but again, really uh, unique experiences that, that can be brought up. I could literally only imagine. So thank you for sharing, Malik. I'm going to pick on Ali next. Yeah, um, what I'm finding is that um, this new normal, it allows me to keep my options open. So I'm not in school anymore, but I have been taking part in many different training programs and certifications and, and boot camps. And what I'm finding is that the greater proximity from the actual space, whether there, there is a, a physical space where that learning takes place, it allows me and encourages me to pivot more if needed, right? So now that there's many, the, the way that, that learning is set up now where it can be portable, it can be customizable, customizable it, it, it can be personalized, that you can um, start something and then drop it and then, and then come back to it, right? So it, it is a lot more um, freedom and a lot more exploration these days.
compared to when I was in a U of T. Interesting. So it sounds like flexibility is a big, or is an important aspect of your own personal experience. And you like the sort of asynchronous and synchronous aspects of things. Very interesting. Thank you for sharing, Ali. Shamal. Um, yeah. So first of all, I definitely agree with uh, everybody's points. I think they're all the, the things that I wanted to touch on. So yeah, definitely. There's so many challenges that comes with this new normal, but I feel like it is almost exciting to sort of like welcome these changes um, so that in the future, like Malik said, it's like very inspiring to see what kind of new innovations are going to come out of this. So it's, it's very nice to sort of witness that. And um, my new normal is definitely a hybrid uh, model. I feel like um, there is an abundance of accessibility and flexibility when um, education is sort of shifting towards this hybrid model. Um, and then the other thing that um, that <clears throat> this new normal sort of helps is I found a work integrated learning and like our internships uh, that we do um, usually at the end of our studies, right? So I graduated Centennial and my last semester was my um, co-op semester, my internship semester, and then um, I started my career and it was um, it was a great um, uh, internship and I really learned so much from it and it was so rewarding. And I was very um, skeptical about the fact that it was going to be fully remote and I wasn't really gonna get any like industry knowledge or like that get that like networking um, aspect from it. And um, I personally uh, was afraid for no reason because I, I ended up getting like a really great experience. Um, so it was great for me to have the ability to do it remotely actually in the end because uh, I was also in the meantime, I was sort of pursuing my other interests and just, you know, uh, trying to keep uh, educating myself as much as possible. So like Ali, since I was uh, graduated, I, I've been, even when I was in my internship, I've been just trying to like um, keep, keep being open and trying to discover boot camps, training sessions, uh, like courses that I can take to just enhance my career and improve upon uh, my other passions. So it was great that I had the ability to do it remotely. But as Sydney was talking about it earlier, sometimes like you you want to uh, you want that experience to be in person because you're in there for like the studio, the um, the tools, like those like in person, like those physical elements. And if you do an internship where you need to like actually um, sort of be in like a physical place and you don't get the chance to do that, you're not really learning anything from it. For example. Uh, in the School of Hospitality, there were a lot of uh, event students who were uh, studying special events management and um, things like that, where you need to have access to an event center and uh, a meeting room, sort of like learn the logistics and everything like that. But when you don't get the chance to do it in person and your only option is remote, then um, in some professions and some career aspects, you miss out a lot and you don't really get to kickstart your career after graduation. So I think in the future, there has to be a lot of flexibility with internships. So if people are uh, able to do stuff remotely, and if that's if that doesn't interfere with their uh, actual job and their career aspirations, I think it should be a lot more common to do it how it is being actually done in the real world. Because Internships are supposed to be getting you ready for the real world and not like just keep educating you on like theoretical knowledge. So um, I feel like that will be something that's going to be challenging because like with the vaccinations, we're still like we're seeing more increase in like in person stuff. But with internships, I feel like uh, there definitely needs to be more flexibility and like the choice needs to be given to the learners to decide what kind of a future that that they sort of want to take part in. But yeah, it's definitely exciting to see how all of these are going to be shaped in the future. Thank you very much for sharing, all of you. And, and Shamal, if I'm going to extract a key point there, you, you kind of mentioned that there has been some challenges with the 
solely remote working aspect and I'm guessing there's some challenges with networking and yeah I mean providing on a work standpoint and educational delivery standpoint like it's I think very important for students to have options and flexibility if applicable like what works well for some students might not work well for others and that is the same sort of concept within the working world you know some people very much prefer to study or work remotely and, and others very much prefer to have that in-person connection and, and both so it's very interesting to see the sort of merit of your experiences here so thank you all for sharing i want to follow up with a very basic question it's a it's an easy question probably a difficult question to answer but what are some challenges you've all been facing studying and working remotely yeah so as i mentioned before that I like to keep my options open and I'm, I'm, I'm always working on different projects and and such. I think that how it's gotten a bit trickier is that, you know, when I was in school and when I was at U of T, how I used to net, network was by going and physically knocking on, on doors. So at, at that time, there was much more curiosity. And now it just now learning can feel like a task in, in, in order as it just it's it's manifesting as a as a very um, clear cut stepping stone. So I know in previous con conferences we've talked about you know just you know w what is the purpose of an academic institution is to really foster that sense of curiosity and exp exploration. So I've been working on really trying to cultivate that w within the confines of a remote workspace and um now that things are reopening and that ocad is is, is reopening and I, and I can choose to go back to work on some days it's entirely optional that's something that i, I would I, that i'm looking forward to uh, doing so that's that's the the first thing of um how i'm you know how the journey is changing what I what I do like about this this journey so far, as I mentioned before, is that the way that learning is designed now is it's it's much more um, clear cut, and there and depending on the offering or, or or the module, is that there are clear stepping stones and there's not really that much room for doubt or confusion. So any challenges or distractions would be coming from either my personal environment or something logistical. Gotcha, gotcha. Thank you, Ali. I'm going to pick on Malik next. I would say uh, one of the biggest challenges uh, for this academic year specifically is the pressure to return completely to what it was in early in 2019 and early 2020. Um, so to give you the example for my situation is that this semester is probably my favorite semester. I have a good mix of in-person, hybrid, and asynchronous. And I think that works really well for me, like be in person for what works there and be online for what works there. And that flexibility is great. But for the winter semester, everything is in person and there are little alternatives to return back to an, a hybrid asynchronous method, which is sort of a, a, a bummer because like as i mentioned before like i'm really excited to see the evolution and i think like some institutions may still see this hybrid learning as just a um, sort of like a a short-term solution to just address the pandemic and then when it's over we just go back to what it was and um and i really see that as a missed opportunity again to to give like really good options for all students and to give that sort of flexibility um, you know, for me, like I'm obviously really, uh, as a business student, particularly, um, it's really great to be in like a community again and, and to do that. Um, but when we discuss like even co-ops and internships, as, uh, Shamal mentioned, like it's really a great idea to offer that flexibility for, um, one to save costs for students, like to move and to do that, but also just to provide a lot more, um, opportunities to work with firms all around the world, even from your home. Um, and to really uh, close those barriers for, for students that may not be able to afford to do an unpaid internship or a co-op uh, in, in a city that has high rent costs, as we're seeing um, like just cost of living in general skyrocketing uh, during like, you know, 
pandemic recovery. Um, so overall, I would say those are my challenges. So for anyone watching in those spaces, I really encourage you to continue pushing instead of clawing back to, to what it was before. Um, but also, again, like Ali mentioned, I, I think like uh, a lot of these asynchronous courses particularly are very like cookie cutter, I would say. Like um, there's not really a lot of room to foster like meaningful discussions or like that academic sense that we did with in-person learning still, um, which I can understand for very large classes. But um, I think like it, it would just, it's like a little bit more motivating when there is that sense of, of growth um, instead of just regurgitating textbook information that aren't free without OERs. So uh, that's another thing to consider too. Thank you very much for sharing that perspective, Malik. And it sounds like because you have a taste for, I mean, given your experience and this sort of unique perspective of having experienced what the normal was like pre-pandemic to having gone through multiple phases of entirely remote to what's going to be entirely in person, which seems like it's an institutional or departmental choice. And it sounds like if I'm going to make an assumption that you don't want it to be binary, that now that you have a taste for what it means to study remote, that personal choice is really a priority for you. Is that is that correct? Is that assumption correct, Malik? Yeah, I, I would say so. Like, obviously, nothing wrong with, with seeing my props face to face. I'm super excited to, to see them again. Um, but obviously, like, I think there's a lot of need um, for that. Like, I, I don't I definitely don't think I'm alone in, in that sense. And a lot of students actually need it now uh, and sort of like can't go back for whatever concerns there are. Um, so I definitely think it's like, you know, I don't really see a valid reason to go backwards, if that makes sense. For sure, for sure. And it'll be very interesting. It's, it's very interesting to me to think that there might be a perception that, you know, studying remotely or hybrid models was only like a temporary sort of setup or solution. And that'd be very interesting to see if others have that perspective. Shamal, I'm going to pick on you now. Um, yeah, I think my points were uh, actually very similar to what Malik was talking about, so I'm just going to uh, touch a bit more on that. I think uh, the other um, thing to note is, yeah, like people just can't go back to how it was before anymore. And it's very, um, I don't think it makes sense to like sort of uh, push the notion that it's either online or either in person. I feel like that just doesn't make sense at the stage that we're in. I feel like uh, both like the industry and the learners have come to this sort of like place where like everybody's used to um, the online learning component and but not everybody wants to do this all the time. But um, I think Malik also touched on this a bit earlier but um, People now get like a lot more accessibility um, features and like a lot more ways that they can be accommodated that people were thinking were, were just not possible before. Um, people would just never even consider certain accommodations that are now being provided as uh, <clears throat> legitimate ways of supporting a learner. But that is being actively shifted towards like a new reality, and I think that's awesome. So. Um, co going completely back to in-person and how it was before would, I don't think it would make sense in my opinion, because there's also the social anxiety aspect that, that like sort of like creeps in. Um, it's really hard to just like fully go back to an environment where you've never been in some cases, or like you haven't been for such a long time that it feels like, oh, what's going on now? What do I need to do now? I kind of forgot. So um, it's really important to like provide um, accessibility, like just like, I think I said accessibility like, for, like 50 times already, but I think that's just like this whole new normal thing really um, like makes me understand and realize that we can be a lot more flexible in our post-secondary and or continuing education journey um, than we currently are. I feel like people can still learn and sort of like still have like their own personalized ways. So I think um, that's going to be like a challenge that will sort of be uh, like be that will be sort of um, tackled. 
uh, in the future. But yeah, um, and then the other challenge, I guess, is um, graduation, right? So I know that like people who graduated in 2020 um, or even like late 2019, they still haven't had their convocation. So my graduation experience was really weird. It was completely not something that I was expecting. It was like a video of all of our cl classmates' names. And that, that was like an experience that I was like looking forward to. So I feel like institutions will definitely in the future make some sort of adjustments for, for those uh, graduates who didn't get to uh, get that like in-person um, experience, which is something that you can't ever give up, right? So like while you can like make these changes in the online uh, or like post-secondary education experience, you want to have like you want to keep specific things like some social aspects, um, but you don't have to keep everything the way it, it, it used to be. So it can always just like um, shift and like take uh, like uh, take new forms and just, you know, be as um, inclusive as possible. Thank you very much for sharing that perspective, Shamal. I mean, yeah, I mean, particularly in the convocation piece, that's got to be a bit of an adaptation on your part in terms of just managing your expectations for what that event has. I'm sure you've been thinking about this for a long period of time in terms of studying or pursuing your educational career. I mean, it sounds like re-adaptation is kind of a, a key word I can synthesize from a lot of these conversations. Is for, for Malik yourself, like you're being expected to go back to the old normal, so to speak, and that's involving a re-adaptation. You have that sort of taste of what it likes to study remotely. And for both of you, I mean, it sounds like studying remotely has been an enabler for your own personal experiences, particularly with accessibility, as you mentioned, Shamal. Um, thank you both, though, for sharing, and sorry, all three of you for sharing. And then Sydney, you're up next. Hi, thanks, Chris. I think so there, there are two key things. I think a major challenge that I personally have been facing, but that I've been seeing everyone else facing really, is that there is a kind of collapse of community in the educational world. I think that, I, I guess by that I just mean that it seemed that everyone was sort of in a survival mode and I, I get it, I do. I think, <laughs> I'm glad I wasn't an educator is all I'm going to say. Being thrown into the online world as a student was intimidating, but to redo your entire curriculum as an educator, I can't imagine. I think that <laughs> would have been, I, I get it. I understand that you have been in survival mode and that we all have, and it's not just education either. It's other industries as well. But as a result, I've seen this sort of neglect on community building in schools and otherwise. So in my final year of school, it was entirely online and I was working on my thesis. And usually you would expect to see, you know, outside speakers and you would expect to have some networking events and you'd get to uh, show your work to people outside of your own industry. It's really about you know, seeing how your work is understood by other industries because you're not working in a vacuum. We all have to interact with one another. And yet that's kind of what happened when we were online. It really did become a bit of a vacuum and even worse for students. I was speaking with first years and was working with first years for the first half of last year, kind of getting them integrated and into a bit more of community building at OCAD U at least. And the thing that I kept hearing over and over again was that so many students hadn't made a single friend in any of their classes. And it's no secret that a lot of people go to university and to college and to higher education in general to make friends and to have that community and to build a network. And that's ultimately the thing that usually gets you a job. And if that's your goal at the end of education is not just to, you know, become skilled in your trade, but to get a job in it and to have a network in it. We can't just expect students to show up to, you know, these online learning engagements with everyone's camera off and everyone's muted the whole time. And it just becomes like an educator podcast. 
I think there just needs to be so much more time put aside now, now that we're a bit more adjusted to introducing your students to one another, to holding more community building events, and to bringing in people outside of the community to kind of challenge what you're doing and what, where your thoughts are at and what your students' understanding of the world is, really. So that's a big one. I would say the community piece is huge. But if you're an educator and you're listening, I mean, I get it. My mom was doing the virtual schooling and yeah, turning your whole curriculum into an online one overnight and being, you know, handling students that have um, never been in this kind of learning environment. Everyone's kind of just running around like chickens with their heads cut off. I, I get it. But now that we're a little more adjusted, I think more time towards community building is really needed. And another thing I just wanted to touch on, which I, I would not have uh, until Shamal brought it up, is the convocation, actually. I think convocation was a huge challenge for a lot of students who graduated because that was another event where there was no community present, where we saw names of the students that we spent four years with come up on a PowerPoint and slide through, but I didn't see anyone's face. And I hadn't seen so many of those faces all year. And yeah, I would have I would have liked to graduate that way. <laughs> so I'm getting really teary eyed. I mean, yeah, you just, <laughs> it was supposed to be such a big event where you get to kind of congratulate your peers and having it reduced to a Zoom call <laughs> was, disappointing to say the least but I think just just make sure you're focused on your communities and checking in on your students and and building those communities I know it's hard but you got this you can do it the students want it you want it <laughs> you you'll get it really appreciate you sharing your perspective Sydney I mean yeah I think it's totally okay by the way in terms of the emotional response here because I mean I would feel very strongly that I would want to almost experience that I guess rite of passage passage which is convocation I mean like you do have expectations for that sort of experience and, and convocation is very important for for many learners and yeah I mean we've identified here in this conversation so far that I mean, personal choice and flexibility and multiple forms of delivery is a priority, but there's also, we need to have an honest recognition that there are some limitations to being solely remote or solely in person, as Sydney just identified. And yeah, we're almost advocating for personal choice and flexibility, but we have to be very critical and challenging of, you know, some of the limitations for these things. And you mentioned some really good points, Sydney, there about the collapse of community and, and specifically referencing convocation. I mean, I kind of want to pivot the questions a little bit and go, go down this rabbit hole of how can institutions facilitate community? I mean, if we're imagining a reality where some students are studying entirely remotely, some students are entirely in person, some are a bit both, like if we provide, if institutions set up systems where there is that flexibility in multiple forms of delivery and even in one course you have s s various students that are studying in different sort of modalities like how can we facilitate community like do we just force students to you know meet up in person and, and have some in-person mandatory in-person engagements to kind of put them in the wild and, and you know the, the notion that like you learn best in your discomfort zone is that something institutions should do or like how can we facilitate community in a ecosystem where flexibility and personal choice is paramount yeah i guess that's a really heavy question and and obviously uh i think it really does depend on what community you're specifically talking about but um, so for my program specifically, um, I so I have to go to France for two years as a part of my program and I leave next year. So a big part of that personally was exploring. Yeah, yeah, it's actually really cool. Another cool thing about transferring programs. Um, but one of the things I was sort of trying to figure out was the difference in learning styles between here and there. And what I was sort of uh, found out is that that in France, all the work is sort of done within class time. 
uh, sort of forcing, or not forcing, but encouraging class participation and sort of like getting things done in class, which can be intense. But once you leave class, that's it. Like you are free to do as you like. And I think that's a really great way to force uh, community building outside of the classroom because how it works sort of right now, especially in the synchronous and asynchronous realm, is that we have assignments until midnight and uh, I'm, I tend to just bury myself in, in homework and in studying outside of class. Um, so obviously the uh, isolation aspects can be pretty intense uh, for everybody. Uh, so I think that like adapting different models of class participation uh, instead of just like a podcast, as Sydney mentioned earlier, into something more interactive, both encourages more like creative ways of learning and, and also promotes that academia, while also sort of forcing people to hang out and find uh, creative ways just to let loose, get together, talk about class content, and do that kind of thing without the pressure of deadlines and of um, of needing to bury themselves and the sort of like work uh, focused um, ecosystem that we've had, especially like it being sort of really out there during the pandemic where, you know, everybody has back to back to back meetings, back to back to back courses with no time to even focus on that community, which I think really uh, um, does not help with that void we were talking about earlier. Um, so I think, you know, looking at different uh, how like different ways of learning and different ways of, of being in class is really a great step into doing that. Um, so that's why I'm very excited to go next year to, to, to explore that method of, of learning. Uh, but adapting it here would be really cool as well. Thank you for sharing, Malik. I mean, that's amazing. You're going to France for a couple of years. That's fantastic. I mean, for myself, like travel has been one of the most profound educational experiences. So I'm sure you're going to have a great experience and, and learn a lot. In the essence of time, I'm going to move along to some other questions. But if you want, I mean, please feel free to weave in uh, your response or your thinking on how institutions can facilitate community in a online, asynchronous, virtual, and in-person hybrid sort of setup. Um, once again, though, I want to thank you all for sharing your perspectives, and I understand that for, for many of you, it's, it's very important to, you know, as I said, have flexibility, but really, you know, ensure that the quality of your experience is, is high. And you talked a little bit about how the landscape has shifted, but based on your perception, do you think there will be permanent changes to education delivery as a result of this pandemic? I mean, the model of education delivery has remained relatively constant for what feels like forever. And, and based on even my own user research with learners in the eCampus Ontario Experience Design Lab, I, mean, I hear that the classic model of education where students sit in a lecture hall and listen to a teacher for three hours is not exactly the ideal form of delivery that's conducive to really how we learn or even absorb information from a physiological standpoint. So in other words, do you get the sense that educators who have dabbled with online or hybrid models will maintain these newish approaches? Are hybrid models here to stay? And I'll pick on Ali. Yeah, based on what I'm hearing um, from friends and family is that there is a lot of um, inconsistency of delivery in online classrooms. Um, so this could be that, you know, that there could be an inconsistency of educational resources which are accessible. There could be, you know, different takes on whether to provide recordings of the lectures or, or not. A big point of contention is um, the practices and technology used in examinations. Right, so um, even though that the dust has settled, there are, I would say that there are some things which need to be standardized through proper um, accessibility and inclusivity um, paradigms. Shamal, are hybrid models here to stay? Uh, I think definitely, I think there should be some um, permanent changes that incorporates uh, hybrid models um, and also, in my opinion, asynchronous learning because uh, what 
the pandemic has brought in uh, with the distance learning and with online learning was um, just like more time for people to focus on uh, the rest of their lives, not just their education and um, the, the stuff that comes along with it, like commuting and things like that. But just, you know, any other passion that they may have or like just simply spending more time for themselves and things like that. And you can really achieve that with asynchronous learning and, um, and uh, online learning. Um, and like we touched on earlier, we don't want to like eliminate all the social and, you know, just like the traditional aspects of in, like in-person learning. But we definitely want to keep, uh, make some permanent changes so that um, people can actually like learn more in less time and, and without like committing so much of their um, energy uh, to one course or one program. Um, I think that's, that's really key. And um, in order to do that, I think um, being uh, able to like, ma like making sure that the online learning components are as interactive and as interesting as possible to make sure that uh, students are actually paying attention uh, rather than like doing something else. And uh, as Sydney touched on earlier, it's like I, we, I totally understand from like the education, educator point of view to like sit down and really create a curriculum that will be like very attention grabbing in an online environment. Uh, but it's also uh, important to think that those are the types of things that will make uh, the education journey like very rewarding for both parties because one thing that really gets on the educators nerves about online learning is no interaction zoom like zoom webcams are all like shut down nobody's like really talking nobody like you can't even see anybody's expression so you don't know how whatever it is that you're teaching you don't know how it's being received and i can understand how challenging that can be but i feel like that can be mitigated um, or that can be sort of improved upon if um, there's more time and effort uh, on an instructional design perspective, designing um, online components and presentations such that it's not like a podcast, but like an in interactive um, element. So with that, I feel like uh, the more interesting and the more interactive we can keep online learning, the more permanent they can be and the more enjoyable they can be for both parties so that it can enable more growth on on many different aspects. Thank you, Jamal. There is, I want to hear from all of you, but our time is running short and there's a question I really want to ask Sydney specifically, if that's okay with you. I mean, sure. you've joined us for two test events and for both events, the conversation was focused on your experience as a current learner studying at one of Ontario's colleges and universities. But now I know we're all lifelong learners here, but a learner perspective that I think is often overlooked is the experience of having just graduated. I personally want to know how you've been managing upon graduation. I mean, which is very important for and, and definitely prominent in I think most students' minds when they're approaching graduation. So what's it been like trying to find jobs in a virtual market, Sydney, if I can totally call you out there? You know what? I'm going to be completely blunt and I'll start by saying expensive and time consuming. <laughs> I So, okay, for context, I finished school and I felt like I didn't learn enough about technology's piece in design. And, you know, that wasn't there's it's nobody's fault for that like we didn't see the pandemic coming and now the industry has really shifted into more interface heavy solutions so I did go back to school I went to brain station for the summer I took a course in UI design it was really fantastic I loved meeting you know other folks that are outside of the design world and people that are already working professionals and it really helped me expand my network for sure and also just my my general outlook on you know my position in the world and what I want to do <laughs> um, and then I think you know so yeah I said expensive because it, it was a bit risky it felt scary kind of finishing school and going right back into more school <laughs> however I think it's been it's been okay it's been pretty 
pretty all right. I've had to really step out of my comfort zone and try to do more networking, which in the online world I didn't, I had avoided for quite some time because it felt very transactional. But I think realizing that the people on the other side of the screen are also just as nervous as I am and are also as weird as out, weirded out in the online world as I am, you know, at the end of the day, I think we are just after that community piece and just want to speak with other people and hear about their experience. So yeah, I mean, post-grad life has been pretty okay. I got a job pretty much immediately out of school and have been doing well in that respect. And if not for the online learning environment, you know, I probably wouldn't have gone back to school so soon, which now that I have gone back to school, I think I'm happy I did that for sure. And then also it's just not always as accessible. You know, um, I had wrist surgery recently. I don't think I would have been able to just jump back into work if not for the online learning environment. So yeah, all that to say, being a recent grad, it's, it's a bit expensive and a little scary sometimes. And you have to jump out of your comfort zone. But for the most part, if you just do that, it, it seems to be going okay. I mean, everyone else is a person <laughs> that I'm speaking with. Everyone else is going through these these uh, human struggles right now. So I think people are relatively empathetic and kind to one another more so now than ever. So it's probably a good time to be a graduate, maybe. <laughs> Very interesting response. I mean, I'm glad you sort of had that sort of empathetic epiphany where you realized that, you know, you're not alone here, which I'm sure there's some console right there but um yeah you're not alone and everyone is experiencing this as well and also probably feel is very awkward and maybe disconnected in many ways so thank you for sharing i definitely would like to follow up with you on how your experience is going in the job market in the essence of time i'm going to continue downstream with some other questions it's almost that time here and i want to pick on malik for that because you're one of the i guess only current students or the ones who's continuing your studies right now as a transfer student too and so my question for you is like, what advice do you have for educators? And I'll also be remiss if I didn't actually mention that like kudos to all educators like, across the world. I mean, like online education delivery or solely online has really been a tiny fraction of post-secondary education. And yeah, I mean, like it's really important to recognize that educators are also people too. And you know, they don't always have, I guess, technological fluency in many ways. And yeah, I mean, I want to just thank all the educators in the room that are listening to this conversation right now that like really kudos to you guys for adapting and pivoting. And obviously not all of the experiences were without issue. But yeah, I mean, I think on behalf of students, we, we definitely thank you for your efforts to shift to remote teaching and learning. And yeah, Malik, what's your advice for educators on that note? Yeah, well, I would echo that sentiment. Like, educators have gone through even more than anybody, I would say, like to create all these brand new types of learning and, and all these syllabuses and like all these different like ways of learning to specifically meet the needs and the issues of students in such short notice is incredible. To give you an example, like uh, my dad has been a computer science professor for roughly 35 years. And like you mentioned earlier, it, the, you know, the technology itself has increased, like has fundamentally changed. Like he started off with putting code through punch cards. And now we have like, you know, M1, Max, 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 Max out there. So like, um, it's a really amazing how like that shifts. But in terms of like grading papers and, and doing the lectures, that has not changed almost at all. So to do this fundamental shift over the last two years is really incredible. My best advice really, is, I think we touched on this during our last test conference, but is to, you know, keep being, uh, you know, optimistic and compassionate towards everybody um, because that's really all we can do. Um, and obviously like continuing conversations and listening to conversations like we have today is really, really great. Um, to at least, you know, open up to different perspectives and, and to navigate with that newfound information or newfound perspectives. Um, I think that's like as basic, I know that's like pretty broad, but like, um, you know, education is not a, a one-stop shop. It's definitely very 
um, abstract and is very specific to the needs of your students and, you know, whatever that that is. Um, but I would just like to thank, you know, whoever's listening for listening and for tuning in because, um, you know, we're all students. We're all lifelong learners, as you famously say, Chris. Um, and that's really, really all we can do. But I really encourage learners to to push on and to not look back on on what has been and, and to look at what could be. Uh, because I think that's a really cool thing to, to do is to is to explore new ideas and to explore new systems and different ways of, of doing things. And um, I think that's really exciting. So thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Malik, for sure. Well, it's been such a lovely conversation and it's really nice to, to hear you guys again and to see your faces again and to really kind of track the evolution of your learning journey. I mean, it's just very historically significant from your perspective, from my perspective, that you all have had a taste and have dabbled into multiple different modes of teaching and learning. And yeah, it's really, really fascinating to get your response. And in tune to what you were saying, Malik, I mean, yeah, I mean, students have a breadth of different experiences and opinions and perspectives on what their experience is like. And I think the most important thing educators can do is really tap into their student perspectives. Like it's free user research essentially. And for eCampus Ontario, it's very important to us to understand, you know, have a finger on the pulse on what students are thinking and how we can ensure your experiences are just a little bit better moving forward. And yeah, it's very important that I think for the sector to really listen to the voice of students. Once again, I want to thank you all for joining and good to see you guys again, for sure.